revolutions. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. What is the nature of modern revolutions? How are they related to the question of rebellions? And what do we acknowledge to be a legitimate and historically important revolution? I want to start with that question, because when we look at Nazi Germany, for instance, and how Adolf Hitler came to power, we don't tend to call that a revolution, partly because of the terrible atrocities that happened in the wake of Hitler's coming to power. Similarly, we don't really want to acknowledge the Khmer Rouge and what they did in Cambodia, Kampuchea, with the slaughter, the genocide of so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Cambodians as a revolution, even though the Khmer Rouge itself regarded their exercise in history as a rewind to year zero to start time again from a fresh base. You can't have a more revolutionary aspiration than that. But the atrocious consequences of what happened in Kampuchea are so horrendous that people are very reluctant to accord the title of revolution to what happened. We tend to acknowledge the great revolutions of modernity, and starting with what we've already discussed in terms of the English Revolution of the 17th century, the execution of King Charles I in 1649, the huge debates that surrounded the uprising of Parliament against the King, people like Winstanley, people like the Levellers and the Diggers, Everybody talking about two key things, and that is the nature of equality and also the nature of the social contract. In whatever governmental arrangement was able to come into being, what was the relationship between those who ruled in some way, conditionally or not, and those who were ruled. What was the nature of that social contract? A debate that began with Thomas Hobbes and his great work Leviathan, and which continued throughout the entire 17th century. And as I said in a previous lecture, what you have as a hallmark by which we remember the English Revolution is essentially the ethic of rebellion, that is right to rebel. And that's very, very much why we began this whole course with an excerpt from Paradise Lost by John Milton, in which Satan rallies his fallen angels in hell and essentially declares himself full of justice in rebelling against God. So the nature of the social contract, the nature of the permissibility, the justifiability of rebellion for our modern era really does begin in the English Revolution. But what have a brief look today at some other revolutions that followed in its wake? We have the French Revolution that began in 1789. It was carried forward in the era of Napoleon into the 1800s. And although it post-dated the American Revolution that began in 1776, I'm basically going to contend that the French Revolution was the first to complete a certain ethos of constitutionalized equality, constitutionalized rights, and constitutionalized transparency that affected far more than just France, but affected most of Europe, not least because Napoleon conquered most of Europe, and which had a transatlantic influence by the personages and the teachings of people like Thomas Paine in America as the United States struggled to find its feet after the inauguration of its revolution in 1776. We're going to have a look as well at the Russian Revolution, 1917, and then conclude and have a longer look at the 
Chinese Revolution that was successful in 1949. And I think I said at the end of my last seminar that one of the things that is very instructive but very enigmatic is when you look at the videos, uh, the news of footage of Mao accepting in 1949 the march past of the victorious Red Army in Beijing in Tiananmen Square from the podium above the gates of the Forbidden City what you had was an antique spectacle where Mao using an antique spiritual language, almost like a witch chant, accepts the mandate of heaven. In other words, he spiritualized the justice of what he had done. I want to come back to that because that actually marks a moment which also takes us back to last week's lecture about the Iranian Revolution. We're not going to repeat what we said about the Iranian Revolution, which I regard as one of the great revolutions in the lineage of the American, French, Russian, Chinese, and then finally the Iranian Revolution. They form, as it were, a lineage, a genealogy, if you like, with a root in the English Revolution of the 17th century. But let's have a look at the American Revolution, since it seems to prefigure everything else after the English Revolution, everything else that was meant to have been afterwards. And it is meant to have had a huge influence on the world. We still have the trumpeting of American values, of democracy, and of all of these things associated with freedom that has affected and in fact developed our sense of modernity in the world today. Now, the first point I want to make is a very contentious one, and that is I don't actually think the American Revolution was for the sake of democracy. It was for the sake of establishing a republic. Now, this republic came to have democratic values, which were quite slow to develop, as I'm going to explain. But the idea was to achieve independence from Britain. In other words, in the first instance, it was a war of liberation, a phenomenon that we're very, very used to in the 20th century as we've surveyed an entire 100 years or more of decolonization and post-colonial history. In a way, the American Revolution was one of the first great decolonial wars of liberation. Uh, following upon, I hasten to add, what was being accomplished in Latin America in the wake of the uprising of people like Simon Bolivar, for instance. And if you go down the streets by Warren Street Tube Station in London, uh, just at the top of Tottenham Court Road, uh, you're going to see statues, you're going to see blue plaques to the originators of the Latin American revolutions. They all took refuge in London and Fitzrovia, the Warren Street area, was where they basically hung out. Uh, Britain, at least, was a place for exiles trying to do something astonishing, something historical. But in terms of the American Revolution, it was something which was very, very slow uh, to develop. Uh, what you had really uh, was something that was in slow motion. So you had the revolution itself and the Declaration of Independence, very noble words in 1776. Uh, but what you also had was uh, a pause. The Constitution uh, only was adopted in 1787. So there's a gap there. The Bill of Rights, uh, the famous expression of equality and democracy under God and under nature, that only came in 1791. Uh, and at the same time, and people tend to forget this, the Bill of Rights was accompanied by uh, agreements to limit the powers of the federal government. Uh, in other words, the priority of the states in a very complex balance of power was also accomplished at exactly the same time as the Bill of Rights. In other words, what you had was not only a Bill of Rights that declared an emancipation 
of individual people. It was also part of an era of legislative accomplishment, which made sure that the individual could not be made subject to any kind of a central overlordship. So in some ways, at that point in time, the priority was in terms of the individual states being able to stand up to the central government very, very much as a protector of the rights of the individual. And of course, we see this essential contradiction to this day. When we come very shortly to the American election, uh, will it be a rerun of what happened with Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump last time around, where she won the popular vote democratically in terms of the popular franchise, and she should have won, but the Electoral College involving the states declared for Donald Trump. So that tension that began at that point in time in 1791 continues to affect American politics and, of course, the rest of the world to this present day. But American democracy, insofar as it was essentially subordinated to a balance of power, the states against the federal center, and of course, famously, and this has been copied around the world, the separation of powers in terms of the presidency, the executive, the legislature, that is Congress, and above all, the Supreme Court. And that's why there's so much fuss right now about the appointment of a politically aligned figures to the Donald Trump agenda. It's meant to be a check and a balance precisely against the executive and the legislature. But it's being made subordinate in some way, in this case, primarily to the executive. There's an erosion of that original idea that there would be these complex checks and balances in a balance of power, most ironically emulated and made even more complex in terms of the Iranian constitution, uh, where there are so many checks and balances that it's almost impossible to decipher or to navigate a straight way through. One of the drawbacks about being an academic is that you have to spend a lot of time reading constitutions and trying your very hardest not to fall asleep while you're doing so. Of course, what you have in the Iranian constitution is the final triumph of a central figure, the supreme ayatollah, or the supreme leader. Uh, even so, even that supreme leader is surrounded by a panoply of checks and balances which he can overcome, but which he has to navigate in any case before he can overcome them. This navigation through checks and balances is, of course, a feature of the American Constitution as well. But in terms of the development of democracy, you know, that was really very slow coming in the United States. You really had to wait until President Jackson in 1825, not otherwise known as a particularly great president, uh, before you had some sense of almost universal suffrage for white males, for men. Uh, and even then, there was still a small number of residual property rights following on from what happened in Great Britain uh, throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries, where very, very slowly some sense of empowerment in terms of being able to vote uh, for Parliament began to be accorded to people, but in the first instance, only people who had property. In other words, there had to be material foundation for your democratic capacity. And that was very, very much also embedded in American democracy in the first instance. So even as late as 1825, underneath what we now call Jacksonian democracy, you still had some residual property conditions before you could vote. You couldn't be a homeless person without any property. And you were disenfranchised. You could not vote. But despite that, what you had were other restrictions. Uh, the uh, property rights really didn't go away completely until 1966. Uh, your parents, and certainly I was alive at that point in time, Black people had to wait until 1870 and a civil war. Uh, 
Uh, and even then, what you had in the civil rights movement of the 1960s was a fight against the effective res restriction of voting rights and other civil rights in many of the southern states of America. So again, this idea of a tension between central provision and local state-led restriction, that continued through until that point in time in 1966. Uh, women didn't get the vote until 1920. Uh, that was actually quite long after uh, other countries uh, accorded the women the vote. Uh, I think that my country of New Zealand was the first. Uh, I think that Finland uh, was the second. Uh, the United States basically had to wait until 1920. And the indigenous Indians of uh, the United States of America, the so-called Red Indians, uh, didn't get the vote until 1924. So Jacksonian democracy started something, but it was something that was very, very long in its realization. So that's why I'm stressing the point that the aim of the American Revolution was to create a republic that was independent from Britain, where certainly there were citizens, although the rights of citizens as a whole took a long time to be developed, to be incorporated into the broad sweep of constitutional provision. And of course, famously, when you look at sagas like the Boston Tea Party, it was also a rebellion, a revolution, if you like, against the principle of being subject to taxation without representation. In other words, insofar as democracy was of value in those early days, it was so you could vote against being unjustly taxed. So the material foundation for what we would normally regard as a human right, the materialization of that was embedded in the American Revolution from the very start. Uh, which is why, in my mind, I prioritize the French Revolution of 1789. I've already said to you that King Louis was woken up in the Palace of Versailles by his butler when at the so-called Paris mob, uh, the sans-culottes, that is the people who weren't wearing underpants, uh, they were too poor, that was their nickname, uh, stormed the Bastille where political prisoners against the emperor uh, were being held. And King Louis awoke with a start and said, but why? This is a revolt. And the butler said, no, sire, famously, perhaps apocryphally, no, sire, this is a revolution. And indeed, it proved to be in France a revolution that alarmed the rest of Europe. And why I say it was a genuine revolution was that for the first time, you had the prioritization of the individual as a citizen. In other words, what you had was the basic philosophical thought, not only that people are equal and free, that began, as I said, with the English Revolution, but that they had rights, and that these rights were not just something generalized in terms of some kind of Kantian universal law, some kind of wreck. They had to be constitutionalized and written law, so that the constitutionalization of the equality of the citizen and his or her rights against the king had to be transparently expressed. Now, this is a huge breakthrough, because what it meant was that the state, the permissibility of their being a state, for the first time in history, depended on the citizen, according the state the right to exist within a social contract with the citizen, in which the citizens have transparent, constitutionally expressed rights. Now, it sounds simple now, because we take this for granted, but I take this very much as the great accomplishment of the French Revolution. And although it went through its extremely bloody moment uh, before uh, they turned back from bloodshed with the execution of Robespierre, the great purist of the revolution, the man who could not 
compromise and a greater pragmatism sank into the revolution that finally uh, was enunciated in the personality of Napoleon Bonaparte, a very young, a very successful general. When I say young, he was defeating foreign armies at the age of 22. Uh, so this kind of, as it were, accomplishment in the field allowed him to assume a primacy, a sense of political importance and priority in the French body politic. So when essentially he became, uh, declared himself the first consul, uh, it was basically a coup d'etat on his part. Uh, what you had, however, was Napoleon very, very much carrying forward the ideals of the French Revolution, that is citizenship. And in all his conquests of Europe, and he was probably the greatest and most successful military commander of modern history, uh, for a long time, uh, no army of any kind of European authority could stand against him. I think I've already mentioned that the great Prussian general Clausewitz, whose book on war was still required reading in every single war college on earth, and even read by guerrilla generals, basically it's a treatise of why is this man constantly, continually defeating me. Why can't I stand up against Napoleon, no matter what I try? And the strategies that Napoleon used are still in use to this day. They were used by Guderian, uh, leading the Nazi armies to smash through the French defences in World War II with his Panzer divisions. They were used by Israeli generals to smash through the Egyptian lines in the great wars between the Arab nations and Israel in the early days of the foundation of the state of modern Israel. And basically, what Napoleon was able to pioneer in military terms was accompanied by pioneering in terms of constitutions. Wherever he went, he planted constitutions throughout Europe. So that the idea of transparency, the idea that not only do you have rights, uh, but these rights had to be written down. They could be made justiciable. They could be adjudicated by courts. But these courts were also part and parcel of a balance of power against the executive in particular. So even though Napoleon moved on from being first consul to becoming emperor, uh, what he laid down in his wake wherever he went was the idea of a consolidated social contract that was constitutionally transparent. The nation, the state of citizens, was something that then entered into our accepted history and our accepted practice as political beings in today's world. So I accord far greater importance to the French Revolution in terms of its accomplishment to what was accomplished in the United States, which remains, as I said, and we'll see this if there is again a standoff between the Electoral College and the popular vote in the election in a few days' time, uh, I see the French accomplishment as being significantly more influential in the world uh, than what happened in America. Uh, coming on to the Russian Revolution of 1917, uh, that again was very, very different because what you had was the elevation of the party above the state. Uh, in other words, citizen of the state be damned. Member of the party, uh, particularly membership of the Politburo and the Central Committee of the party were far more important. The party justified itself as the vanguard of the revolution and Lenin had to almost invent this justification for his leadership. He led the vanguard of the party that accomplished the revolution. Because in Marxist terms, the revolution was not possible in Russia. Uh, Marx regarded Russia as part of Asia. Apart from the European fringe uh, around St. Petersburg, etc., etc., built by the Tsar very, very much as an emulation of Paris, uh, and still an extraordinarily beautiful and artistic and cultural city to this day, uh, basically from Moscow onwards, going out eastwards. Uh, it was regarded in Western Europe and certainly by Marx himself as Asia. 
and was certainly regarded as largely under-industrialized. It was very much the poor man of Europe in terms of industrial progress. Western Europe, including, of course, Great Britain and Germany, led the Industrial Revolution with all kinds of difficulties and legacies in cities like Manchester, in this country, for instance. Uh, so when Andy Burnham, the mayor of uh, Manchester, stands up against Boris Johnson, it's not just over COVID uh, and the lockdown. It's very, very much as part of an historical legacy that uh, that was once the great economic giant, the economic engine of Great Britain. It has a proud, independent working class history, which, of course, is not recognisable in today's terms as a working class history because the working class has evolved and morphed so dramatically since then. But there was certainly an industrial working class. No such thing existed in Russia. So in order to create a class system effectively, you had to have a vanguard party that would prioritize the welfare of a working class in creation. But even so, the party had to take priority over the actual workers so that the eventual crushing of the workers' Soviets in cities like Moscow, where some form of industrialization and some form of working class uh, could be discerned, uh, the crushing of the autonomy and the independent decision making of the workers' Soviets was a prioritization of the party. So the idea of the vanguard party underneath a system of doctrine and ideology drawn from Marxism but by now better known as Marxism-Leninism, something that developed in Russia as it became the Soviet Union, but which was essentially a corruption of Marxism as Marx and Engels originally conceived it. And then that was exported to many other places. Uh, many other places took it and adapted it in all kinds of, let's say, hybrid forms. So that the Yugoslavia that emerged after World War II underneath uh, Marshal Tito, uh, that adopted what many people in Western Europe regarded as actually existing socialism with a human face and with a capitalist portion to it was an honorary member of the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which incorporated the 18 most developed, that is, capitalist developed countries uh, in the world in the post-war years. It's an organization that still exists and which seeks to harmonize economic policies across the capitalist world, and particularly in Europe, uh, getting, as it were, a certificate of good health from the OECD is almost as important as your credit rating from the credit agencies, for instance. Uh, it's a harmonization uh, body that ensures that the capitalist world goes forward in some kind of coherent fashion. Well, Yugoslavia was an honorary member of that by far the richest of the communist countries and very, very much independent of Moscow. A great accomplishment of Marshal Tito was that he managed to succeed in making it so. So all of the great scenarios for possible war or possible World War III, Western Europe against the Soviet Union, all of them had to devolve finally to a Soviet assault across the Central Front. In other words, they would have to come rolling across Europe. They wouldn't try to come around and underneath through Yugoslavia because it was accepted that Yugoslavia would resist. Uh, not in our name, not over our territory. So an independent communism, highly regarded by Western figures like E.P. Thompson, who wrote the romantic great masterwork, The Making of the English Working Class, but very, very much unique in the world of communism. The idea of the fully socialistic, communalistic, expression of equality, that is everyone had to be equal in terms of being 
a member of a designated working class. Uh, that basically began in Russia as it became the Soviet Union and was then transplanted into China. Now, I want to spend a bit of time on China. It's a vexed case. When I go to China, and I'm hesitating to go these days because I've said so much in public, which is critical of President Xi, uh, that I'm sure uh, I'm not necessarily going to be fully safe in China. But uh, in the past, uh, I've been invited uh, as part of uh, official uh, delegations, uh, part of official uh, purposes, and been received in high places where behind closed doors they'll listen to my criticisms. And the stock response, uh, and you can almost predict when this is going to come, I'll say at a certain point, but Stephen, um, this is all very well and good, but don't forget, at no time in Chinese history have the Chinese people been more prosperous or more free. And that's actually right. Underneath the thousands of years of absolute dictatorship by emperors, the Chinese people were not free. Such freedom as they might very conditionally have right now is a million light years removed from the feudalism, the absolute feudalism of the era of the Chinese emperors, which really only began coming to an end towards the close of the 19th century. And only when the degeneracy of the emperor's system is exposed by the triumph, the military and the economic triumphs of the Western powers and of Japan, so my own family history is steeped in the chaos that followed this in the early 20th century. Uh, that followed a period of great anarchy at that point in time, where the emperor could no longer control the entire country. Independent warlords, independent armies of brigands or bandits ruled a huge part of China. Uh, my grandmother was a militia leader uh, that defended uh, her village, uh, which was also armed with machine guns, uh, financed by Chinese diaspora miners who joined the great gold rush in America, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, sent back money for machine guns to guard the village, but still there was a need for foot soldiers. So in the chaos and anarchy, uh, my grandmother became a, a militia leader, you know, a swordswoman, uh, so my growing up with martial arts when the family were refugees to New Zealand was essentially unavoidable. Uh, and when you get these stories at the foot of your grandmother, uh, you've got no choice basically but to believe them. Uh, but that, in that chaos, there were efforts to establish a republic. So the great hero of that early part of the 20th century, acknowledged by both those who object to communism and those who are members of the Communist Party, the great hero was Sun Yat-sen, who tried to establish a republic of China. Now you've got to remember the conditions underneath which Sun was working. When he tried to go to America on fundraising for his project of a Chinese republic, he was denied entry on racist grounds. Uh, he had to essentially secure, probably by corrupt means, uh, some kind of citizenship of Hawaii before he was going to be allowed in to the United States of America. So again, an example of how the American Revolution, despite its trumpeting of democracy, it was quite imperfect uh, when it came not only to red Indians, as we call them, indigenous Indians, the black people, but also to people like the Chinese, the great railways of the United States of America were basically built by indentured Chinese labor. Uh, they built Chinatowns because they felt the need to live close together out of solidarity because they would expect persecution if they were not bound together in a close-knit community. All over the world, they became restaurateurs and laundrymen, 
because that's all they were allowed to do in the wider society. No one chooses to wash other people's clothes. So this kind of thing marked the sense of being Chinese at the beginning of the 20th century, a desire for modernity because of the degradation of the emperor system, a subjugation on the part of the Chinese people by the Western powers and by Japan, which had adapted to modernity extraordinarily well, defeating in the naval battle of the Straits of Tsushima, a modern Russian naval fleet basically sent them to the bottom of the ocean uh, with their newly built modern battleships. But China was easy picking. So in this chaos, um, also with the triumph of the Japanese and taking over Manchuria, 1931, what they called the Republic of Manchukuo, uh, the Japanese basically established a large geographical base in China which has expanded even further in World War II, where what you had was the Japanese sweeping through China, and three republics tried to rule China at once. You had the remnants of Sun Yat-sen's nationalist Republic of China, now led by Chiang Kai-shek, uh, basically able to hold on to some of the inland cities like Chongqing, uh, you had a Japanese-sanctioned puppet government. This is the puppet government that always comes up in Kung Fu films about the Japanese occupation of that point in time. And you had uh, an effort uh, at a very, very small and very fragile, constantly needing to shift its headquarters, communist uh, government. And in fact, the communists and the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek spent a lot of time fighting each other. To be perfectly honest, and I think even to this day, it's rather grudgingly admitted by the People's Republic of China that the nationalists basically bore the brunt of the struggle against the Japanese. It's not as if the communist government and its armies didn't fight. They did. They did win a couple of major victories. Uh, but basically most of the fighting was conducted by the nationalists who were time and again crushed by the Japanese simply because of the greater modernity of Japanese militarized might and also by the ineptitude of the Chinese generalship. In other words, the Chinese left the hard way. You can't appoint your cousin to be general of the 5th Regiment. Uh, you better have someone who knew how to be a soldier. But in this milieu of complete anarchy, chaos, and a struggle for ideological capacity, could you just simply adopt the ideology that had originated from Russia when Russia was so very, very different from China? And when the Chinese had their own racism against the Russians in particular, uh, they basically thought of Europeans in general as rather savage, but the Russians particularly so because they had red hair and particularly red body hair. That was the archetype, the stereotype. And in Chinese mythological depictions of the spiritual world, the demons uh, basically had red hair and red body hair. Uh, so there's something demonic about the Russians. So there was, let us say, a popular hesitation about embracing something with too great a, a Russian stamp. But even so, even though Lenin tried to establish the Communist Party as a vanguard to develop and then to curate the working class, there was even less of a working class in China because of the very, very backward nature of outlook and government on the part of the emperors and its governments. Industrialization was something very, very fragile and very new in China. Even so, because of the influence of the Soviet Union, because of the influence of Marxism, Leninism, Mao began along those lines. And what you had in terms of the Shanghai uprising in 1927 was precisely an abortive uprising of 
such working class, basically conflated with urban people, as was possible at that point in time. Now, it was defeated. It actually became the subject of one of the great books of the 20th century. Uh, this is André Mauro and his book, Man's Fate, sometimes translated as Man's Estate, which I think is one of the great cosmopolitan works of the 20th century, even though it's fallen much out of favour. Mauro actually fought in the Shanghai uprising on the side of the communists. He's actually part of their executive committee, one of the international volunteers. Later he became a heroic figure in the Spanish Civil War on the part of the Republicans against the fascist legions of Franco. And after that became a legendary figure in the French resistance. So he became, a, I think I said last week, a, a figure marginalized by the great intellectual movements of post-war Paris because he took the side of General de Gaulle and became Minister of Culture in a conservative government. Uh, but no one could deny the heroic youth and um, service to revolutionary causes of years gone by. Basically, his great book, Man's Estate, uh, tells the story of international volunteers fighting in the Shanghai uprising. And it's the first book in modern European literature in which Chinese people are treated with complete equality. In fact, at the end of the book, when they all have to commit suicide together, uh, otherwise they would face a terrible execution by being thrown alive into the furnace of a locomotive. Uh, they choose to share up what cyanide they have left and have a quick, merciful death. Uh, the sharing out, uh, whether you're a Chinese or a European volunteer, is told with such plangent terms of equality uh, that I still, for that very passage, not to mention all the passages that go before it, recognize it as a great work of cosmopolitan equality. But the Shanghai uprising failed. It was crushed. It was only after that that Mao realized that he had to take his revolution into the field, essentially, into the rural areas. So we talk about the Chinese revolution today as the revolution of the peasants. It was not conceived like that at the beginning. It was to a certain extent force of circumstance, force of defeat, that forced a change in strategic outlook, fundamentally so, on the part of Chairman Mao. He had to escape the defeat of Shanghai, take his uprising into the field, mobilize his armies. Now, it's the mobilization of his armies that is of some interest to us, because you're going into peasant territory, and not only is the country not industrialized, it's also not educated, it's not literate. Um, people haven't heard of Marx and they certainly can't read Marx. Um, what are you going to say to them? Uh, join the revolution, why, for what reason, underneath what doctrinal guise. And this is where Mao grew from Chinese folklore. Um, and I remember when I was your age and at your level writing my master's dissertation at King's College down the road, uh, my tutors couldn't understand why on earth I wanted to mention a Chinese novel from the 13th century uh, a Xi Nian, um, usually translated into English as the water margin. Pearl Buck, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, an American writer, Pearl Buck called it Four Men Are Brothers, um, uh, in itself expressing not only a gendered equality, but certainly for the first time a sense of equality. And that's what the book is about. It's a huge novel of 108 heroes. Um, the later Japanese television series uh, of the 1970s uh, added a few female heroines, uh, but essentially what you had was 108 heroes in the original 13th century novel, 
uh, who rebelled against the emperor. And they came from all walks of life. So some were generals, uh, some were judges. So they fought alongside others who had been fishermen, who had been peasants in a complete equality. And it's called the water margin because they took refuge in the swamplands. The water margins, the swamplands of Langshan Po. Uh, sort of like the Sherwood Forest uh, from Robin Hood legends. Um, an impermeable wilderness where government forces could not easily track them down. And where they practiced a fierce equality. Uh, thus Pearl Buck's title for her rendition of the tale, All Men Are Brothers. But the key point comes right at the end of the novel. They're about to face the final showdown with the forces of the Emperor, who finally forced them into a field battle, and only one side could possibly win. Uh, they have to go out and face the forces of the Emperor. And the night before battle, the leader of the 108 heroes and their forces has a dream. And he announced it to the 108 the following morning and said, who would believe my brothers? Us each were born under a star. Now this is the mandate of heaven. The stars of heaven bless you. We're going to go out and defeat the Emperor's forces. Who would have believed when I saw it in my dream? Each of us was born under a star. Mao understood the importance of this legend for two reasons. First of all, it taught about equality and righteous rebellion. And secondly, he understood the symbolism of the star. Now, peasants, although they could not read, knew the story because of, well, like ancient Greek days, where storytellers, poets like Homer, would wander from village to village to recite great legends. They'd be paid for it. So there would be a circuit in the countryside where storytellers would come and recount for payment one episode of the water margin. And of course, since there were 108 heroes, there were 108 episodes. You could keep doing this for quite a number of years on your circuit and make money. Uh, it was the village entertainment in the days before any other form of external entertainment was possible. So Mao thought, born under a star. So he had his Red Army carters go into the villages and, and say, look, uh, do you see the berets that we are wearing? And each beret has a red star. You too can fight under a star. Everybody in every village understood what this meant. It was the call to arms. It was the call to serve the mandate of heaven. Now, retelling it like this seems trite, but uh, in fact, something like this actually played a major part in the recruitment of the Red Army. So they went to Mao in Tiananmen Square, reviewing the march past of the victorious Red Army, chanted to heaven an antique language before the web microphone his acceptance of the mandate of heaven. This is entirely fitting with the mobilization strategy Mao admitted to his Soviet friends, in fact, he had never actually read Marxism. Uh, he still got the basic ideas, but sitting down actually to read this guy, uh, that was an ask with too much. But he took the basic tenets that a class of people, even if you had romantically to create that class, uh, could rise up and defeat in the name of equality, sanctioned by heaven's will, rise up and defeat injustice as incorporated into the system of emperorship, who, by no longer serving the people, had lost the mandate of heaven. Now, this is a very cosmic justification for why 
one can rise up. You have to have a heavenly blessing. Now this means that the government against whom you are rising has got to have been so lacking in provision for its subjects, so callous in its treatment of its subjects, uh, that heaven itself would turn its face against a government of that sort. And certainly when you look at the condition of China, uh, not only was the government of the emperor no longer serving the people, it was not even present, it was very, very visibly, and this was apparent even in the countryside, being subjugated and rolled back by foreign forces, running rampant, particularly on the coastal seaboard cities, but elsewhere, particularly in the advance of the Japanese, particularly in the corruption and the anarchy furnished by local warlords and gangs of brigands, that justice seemed no longer to be apparent anywhere that a member of a rural community could look. So the idea of being able to consolidate justice and a just future into a rebellion using the motifs of heavenly sanction, they actually were very, very powerful combination of factors that appeal to, to the peasant population. So Mao was able to mobilize and then forge a peasant army of great efficacy. In the end, it swept the nationalist armies from the field who had to take refuge in Taiwan, where their descendants remain to this day. So the standoff between mainland China and Taiwan continues to this day. So you have this use of mythology. You have this use of ancient motif. Uh, what you have also were the uses of all kinds of things to do with Chinese insularity and being special. Not being special for its own sake as a positive quality necessarily. Being special because of having been subjugated. Uh, and of course, what you had very, very much in the forefront of Chinese minds was the Japanese rape of Nanjing, uh, where hundreds of thousands of Chinese people were executed. Uh, and the idea of being a persecuted people uh, gave rise to the idea of being a very special people, who when they rose up, basically attained the justice of equality against those who had persecuted them. And again, this also explains why it's been so difficult to achieve a settled uh, treaty of peace between China and Japan to this particular day. What does this mean, however, in terms of our study of rebellion? Uh, all of these examples I've used, these were revolutions. They changed the social and political order pretty completely. Only in the English Revolution uh, was there a rollback with the return of the royal family, the return of Charles II. And of course, we remain a monarchy uh, to this particular day, and we still don't have a written constitution. But in all of the other revolutions that we've discussed, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, there was no turning back. There might have been a corruption or a degeneration of key idealistic motifs and ambitions of the revolution, but they have maintained a course that began at the moment of revolution. The point I want to make here, however, is that these were revolutions. In other parts of the world, however, people rebel in the name of certain key principles drawn from one or other of these revolutions. In other words, the spread of idealism from one of the great revolutions may not have led to revolutions in their own right, but certainly led to great rebellions. And you have a look at what Napoleon did in Europe. His planting of constitutions everywhere basically gave a transparent way to de-feudalize societies. 
you could defeudalize and guarantee that you wouldn't slip back into feudalism because of constitutional law and transparent rights of citizens as enunciated through constitutional and legislative means in the wake of what Napoleon accomplished, not only in Europe, but throughout Latin America, for instance. So the defeudalization of society became an international norm because of what happened in France, when people rebelled in the name of seeking this defeudalization or seeking an end to racial discrimination. So the uprising, the rebellion of black slaves in Haiti, led by Toussaint Louverture, basically emulating Napoleon, uh, is something that is one of the great undersung sagas of rebellion. Uh, C.L.R. James, um, in his great book, The Black Jacobins, uh, wrote about this, the uprising, the rebellion of Toussaint Louverture, uh, and basically accorded great agency and great thought to Louverture. And this is the great black rebellion of its day. Uh, he didn't depend on an Abraham Lincoln figure. He rose up in the name of black thought for the sake of black freedom, black equality. And it took an awful lot of French military might to subdue that. So that the legacy of these revolutions is in fact the sense of spreading of value leading to rebellion. Leading of course also to international standoffs, the Cold War, very, very much a battle between those who wish to preserve the status quo associated with what was settled order in America, United States and Europe, and those who wish to take the spirit of revolution further forward despite a settled world which was meant to be hegemonic in the metropolitan powers. So this is not something that has totally gone. And of course, in terms of what is happening inside so-called settled countries that we see today, Black Lives Matter, and the drive for all kinds of equalities in today's world, uh, these rebellions basically hark back to a sense of democracy that demands a sense of equality, which demands a sense of justice. So that rebellions to this day make use of concepts that were developed in revolutions. To be a just citizen means to be an equal citizen and to have those equalities protected. So ladies and gentlemen, that's this week's lecture. So thank you very much.